Hey, welcome back to Bewitching Brain. My name is Justin Zhu. I'm a medical student at the Yale School of Medicine, and I'm excited to be joining the Bewitching Brain video series. We're so happy to have you with us, and we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share. Take good care, be safe, and help others be safe. In the last video, we talked about the structure of neurons and how demyelinating disease can damage our nervous system. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the spinal cord. You may have heard about it in a biology class from your teacher, or maybe you haven't heard much about it before. In any case, you're in the right place. Today, we're gonna dive into what the spinal cord actually does, as well as the anatomy behind it. So the spinal cord is an essential part of our nervous system. So let's start with a quick overview on how the spinal cord fits into the big picture. So we can divide our nervous system into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. We can think of the central nervous system as our command system. It includes the brain, which consists of the cerebral cortex, the diencephalon, and the brain stem. And this is also where the spinal cord fits in. So on the right, here's an image of a spinal cord section drawn by Dr. Teresa Patitucci. We owe a huge thanks to her for her drawings in this presentation. The rest of our nervous system falls under the peripheral nervous system. We have a lot of other nerves that innervate our arms, legs, stomach, and the rest of our body. These nerves send sensory information up to the brain, and they also send motor signals down to our muscles. So the brain is the primary command center, the decision maker, while the peripheral nervous system is like a highway that carries information to and from the external world. Our spinal cord serves as the bridge between these two components. Our definition of the spinal cord is a tube-like structure that consists of a bundle of nerves and cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a clear colorless fluid that nourishes the nerves. So as you probably know, the spinal cord is located in your back. It's protected by a set of bony discs called vertebrae that surround the spinal cord. We have 33 vertebrae in total, and they're divided into five different types. The vertebrae closest to your head are your cervical ones, shown here in blue. Below that are your thoracic vertebrae, then your lumbar ones, then your sacral ones, and finally your coccyx. This image now has the spinal cord filled in, as well as the spinal nerves. As you can see, the spinal nerves exit between each set of vertebrae. So there are 31 pairs of these spinal nerves in total, and they're divided just like the vertebrae into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal regions. Each pair of nerves has a specific function, and we'll get into more detail on what each pair actually does in a future video. So the spinal cord regions don't exactly match up with the vertebral regions. Why is that? Well, the regions actually did match up when you were an infant. However, the spinal cord doesn't grow any longer after you're born while your vertebrae continue to grow. So then what fills up the space below our spinal cord? Well, we have two structures there. One is the cauda equina. It's not depicted in this image, but it's a collection of nerves that usually innervates the pelvic organs and everything below. Another important structure is the conus medullaris. That's like the tapered end of the spinal cord. You'll also note that the spinal nerves connect to the spinal cord itself in a very interesting way. So there's actually two connections or roots per nerve. One root is called the dorsal root and the other is called the ventral root. The dorsal root is in charge of bringing sensory information from the peripheral nervous system to the spinal cord where it's then sent to the brain. Sensory information is any input you get from your senses like taste, touch, hearing, vision, and more. The ventral root 
then brings motor information down from the brain to the spinal cord, which then sends the output to the rest of the body. So information goes up through the dorsal roots and then down through the ventral roots. Now let's focus on the cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord. So what does cross-section mean? Well, it's like when you take a slice of bread. So in a similar way, we're looking at a slice of the spinal cord. In the center, we have the spinal cord itself. It's protected by this outside covering called the meninges. The innermost layer of the meninges is called the pia mater, which means tender mother in Latin. It's a delicate fibrous tissue. Outside of that, we have the arachnoid mater, which resembles a spider web. It's the middle membrane and it's thicker than the pia mater. It's also a loose sac and it serves as a barrier between blood and the cerebrospinal fluid. And the very outermost layer is called the dura mater, which means tough mother in Latin. It's definitely the thickest layer of the three and it's made of dense, irregular connective tissue. So now let's look at the spinal cord itself. It's composed of gray matter and white matter, and it's pretty easy to tell them apart visually because gray matter is usually a lot darker than white matter. Gray matter consists of the cell bodies and unmyelinated parts of neurons. On the other hand, white matter consists of the myelinated axons. There's a lot of key structures in gray matter, and they include the dorsal horn, ventral horn, and lateral horn. So the dorsal horn is involved in motor control as it consists of motor neurons that control skeletal muscles. The ventral horn is important for sensory information and it receives touch and sensation inputs. And finally, the lateral horn is important for sympathetic activity in the autonomic division of the nervous system. The white matter can also be subdivided into several parts, but I won't get into that right now. The main point to remember is that white matter can be divided up into different tracts of axons that carry specific information. And now I just want to quickly get into the structure of the spinal nerves. So as you might know, a major component of nerves are axons. They carry information down from the cell body of one neuron to the dendrites of the next one. The axons are wrapped up in myelin by Schwann cells. This myelinated axon is surrounded by the endoneurium, which is a delicate layer of connective tissue. Groups of axons are then organized into fascicles where they are wrapped up by another layer of connective tissue called the perineurium. A spinal nerve is comprised of lots of these fascicles, which are wrapped up by a final layer of connective tissue called the epineurium. And I want to end off by talking about one of the most important functions of the spinal cord, reflex arcs. Have you ever touched something hot and pulled your hand away quickly without even thinking about it? Have you ever had a doctor hit your knee with a hammer to make your leg kick? Well, those reflexes are all controlled by your spinal cord, not your brain. Your spinal cord is in charge of quick reactions to prevent you from getting injured. It involves two main components a sensory neuron component and a motor neuron component. A sensory neuron brings danger signals to your spinal cord, which recognizes that a quick reaction must be made. The spinal cord then sends signals down your motor neuron to react to the danger. And that's everything. Once again, a huge thanks to Dr. Teresa Patitucci for her spinal cord illustrations. Next time, we'll be talking about the sectional anatomy of the spinal cord in more detail. Thanks for listening, Brainiacs. Tune in next time for more.